Hey, welcome back to Zestology. Just before I start the podcast, I'm running a competition for all of April and I'm giving away a money can't buy prize. It's an hour session with one of the stars of Zestology. He's been a regular guest on the show. He's a good friend of mine as well, Dr. Stephen Simpson. Dr. Steve is one of the world's foremost elite performance coaches and you can win a free hour's consultation with him. It'll be on Skype and all you need to do is go to iTunes and leave a review. And the review can really say whatever you like. Tell me what you like about the podcast, your story, maybe leave something that makes me laugh. I mean, I'm going to be honest, ideally, it'd be a five-star review, but it doesn't have to be. It'd just be an honest review. The winner will get a free hour's consultation with Dr. Stephen Simpson. I'm going to choose the best response at the end of April, and you will win this free hour's session with Dr. Steve. Okay, on with the podcast. Welcome back to Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. Slightly different format to this one uh, because I am with Zestology friend of the show, Dr. Stephen Simpson. Hi, Steve. Hi, Tony. And, and we've decided to do something a little bit different, a Q&A, a podcast Q&A. So that's it. We're just going to get straight into it. Yeah, scary, isn't it? Well, I don't think so. I think it'll be all right. We'll see how it goes. I think it'll be okay. And it might end up with me talking complete nonsense for 45 <laughs> minutes or so, but we'll see how we go. You never do that, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've been asking for some questions. Thank you if you've uh, given us a question, and we'll see how many we get through. And, yeah, it's just a chance. You know, I mean, obviously, Steve's got more than 30 years of medical experience, um, alternative forms of therapy and healing um, you and I met on an NLP course more than 10 years ago yeah. and you've all, you're always getting involved in something different you've always got something you're excited about um, actually perhaps just before we get on the first question something you've been doing for a few years is havening isn't it and you were at the best you expo which is a kind of huge coming together of self-improvement pa- practitioners in the UK and you did this on stage demo which did incredibly well. Perhaps the first question could be mine. What happened? Uh, Tony, I didn't know you were going to ask that. Um, the truth well, is... I don't, be, the, no, I don't want you to be modest. No, I'm Because, I'm not I, going because to be. I know you are very <laughs> modest, but um, I know how successful it was, and, I, yeah. and I'm interested in knowing more about it. Well, I, d- um, I don't know exactly what happened. I don't know exactly what produced the magic. I did use a technique, as you say, called havening. And um, quite frankly, it's when you do any of these techniques, if you as the therapist can get out of the way, um, often things take care of themselves. And And I mean that, which is why you'll never, ever hear me say, oh, you know, I'm a brilliant therapist, or I had this brilliant result, because I just wouldn't say it, because it's not me, it's something else. And um, I say to all my clients, I said, look, as soon as we meet, I say, look, the good news is, is that whatever happens now, you've already got everything inside you that you need. Mm. The problem is, you don't know how to find it. Well, that's perhaps where I might be able to help you to find a way to bring this out. But getting back to this lady, um, she works as a therapist in a secure mental unit, you know, with one of you know the, the most sick, mentally sick people and violent and aggressive and all the rest of it. And when she goes into a cell, um, she's not even allowed to take a pen or even a pencil. She can't go in with anything because anything can be a weapon. Uh, she was as- assaulted severely by a prisoner some years ago, by an inmate some years ago. And she told me this story because I had a stand, you know, I was speaking in the afternoon. She came by in the morning. I was just chatting to her. And as soon as she started speaking, I knew how, how terrible. She was making nothing of it, but I knew what an impact this had had on her life. And I said, now, look, I'm speaking this afternoon. I want to do a demonstration on you because I don't want you to leave this place today the way you're feeling at the moment. She said, there's no way that I could even tell anybody what I've just told you. So I said, OK, we'll go away and have a think about it. The offer's open. She came back, and a couple of hours later, she said, I've thought about it. I just couldn't do it. And I said, what about if you were on stage and you weren't even speaking? And, what, and, and I wouldn't even tell anybody about the story I would just demonstrate the havening technique Mm. she said oh yeah I can do that so I said okay 
make sure I know where you're sitting in the audience and at the right time I'll ask you to raise your hand and come up onto the stage and I did and people gave her sort of an encouraging yeah. round of applause and she whispered in my ear she said I can do it and I looked at her I said are you sure she said yes so I was able to share the story very briefly just as I have done with you and I started this havening technique and you could tell from her face, you know, all the memory was coming back and I apologised for that. I said, look, before I can make you feel better, I actually have to, make, I have to bring this memory back. And her anxiety level, she said, it's a 10 out of 10 or even more than a 10. Mm. Five minutes later, I mean, I knew this without having to ask her because I'd seen her face change. Five minutes later, I said, OK, open your eyes, come back into the room. Where is this now on a scale of 0 to 10? She's, and she laughed. She said... A one, but frankly, maybe not even a one. And then she laughed again. And I said, why are you laughing? She said, because it's just rubbish, rubbish, and laughed. And I, and I said, well, hold on a minute. I mean, this was a very significant thing that happened. And I made a mistake. I said, you know, this isn't rubbish. Well, of course, that's the word she used. I should have just let her go. But then she laughed again. But anyway, um, and as it happens, co coincidentally, I had an email from her today, and I'm meeting her tomorrow. She's mm. coming to one of my meetings, and um, she's still just buzzing, and, and so am I. And I'm so glad this was caught on camera, yeah. because if I was telling people this story, they, they wouldn't believe it. The video of that, is it on your website? Uh, it's not. It's, it's still in edit. Mm. In fact, the edit is a little bit delayed, but it will be out, and you can be certain yeah. that it'll be uh, yeah. on my website. Because yeah. I know people are now listening and thinking... Mm. What is havening? And you've done okay. it on me, and I have to be honest, it wasn't... Obviously, you and I both get involved in lots of different techniques. Yeah. I wouldn't dismiss it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't something that straight away grabbed me as no. being important for me. No, I, I agree, Tony. And that was when I just started, you know, and I knew how powerful this could be. And, you know, I do get very sort of enthusiastic, and you were the first person I thought of. But, um, you know, looking back... A, p a person's really got to have a reason to behave and but for your listeners who want to know a bit more about it I have got a video on YouTube where I demonstrate self-havening because whilst it's better to have a therapist with you while you do it you can actually use it yourself and I teach my clients how to do this so that you can maybe put the link in the show notes or something mm. Uh, self havening it's just a five minute video I just tell people yeah. how to use it for themselves was it Paul McKenna who originally told you about havening it was. He, he talks about it a lot now doesn't he, he? Does. He, he uses it a lot as he part does. of his yeah. kind of armoury of techniques he does he, yeah. I mean he thinks it's absolutely brilliant he said uh, he said you know I can do in five minutes what it used to take me uh, um, no sorry he said this is the this is the best technique I've come across in 25 years and I misquoted him a little bit when I did this demo. I said, you know, this is what Paul, this is what uh, Paul thinks about havening. You know, the best technique that's come out of psych psychiatry for 25 years. I said he's got it wrong. It's 125 years <laughs> because I know we have brilliant psychiatrists and all the rest of it, but things haven't moved on that much mm. since Freud and Jung. I mean, I know CP, C, CBT, Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, yeah. that's very good. They've done some very good research. But there's still so much in the field of psychiatry and psychology that we, we can't help. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm so forgive me if I'm going on a little bit. After I did this demonstration, this lady came up to me and she wanted to know more about Havening. And I talked to her and she said, I'm actually a psychiatrist. She said, you have done in five minutes what I can't do in five years, if ever. And I said, wow. No she, said, way. she said, now why aren't we, why aren't we using this? Why yeah. aren't we being taught this technique? Well, uh, yeah. Um, and I sometimes think, you know, it is as much down to the practitioner as the technique. I mean, you know, I had, as you know, great success with tapping you did, when I was yeah. ill. And, I, you know, I went to someone who um, was just fantastic. And yet, I still wonder, was it the technique or was it him who was so good? Ashley, who's been, he's been on this podcast. Yeah, he, I, I've seen him actually, yeah. and you know, and he's a great guy and very good at what he does. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah, I always think there's an element of you've got to be a good communicator to get the, the, the stuff across. And obviously you ended up establishing a, a magnificent rapport with that woman. But anyway, congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, Havening, something for people to look at. And we've not even gotten to the first question yet. No. Right, okay, so Ali Shaw said... Um, what was the best thing you learned when you were studying NLP? Which is a good question because Steve and I met on an NLP trainer training course in, was it 2007? 
Um, yes, it was. Yeah. yeah, so we've known each other 10 years. Yeah, it's um, my anniversary soon, Tony. Yes, yeah, it's my 10-year anniversary. It's very emotional. <laughs> You're going to take me out for a meal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take you out for a drink after this. Okay, good. Um, so what What was the... Because NLP has kind of provided a bit of a bedrock for a lot of what you and I do since. Yeah. But it's definitely not the only thing that we do. No. And I think I certainly recognise the flaws in NLP as well as the strengths in it. And I think as time's gone on, I've I've noticed the flaws... I still think it's a brilliant set of skills, but it's not the be-all and end-all. So, would you agree with that? Um, I would, yeah. I would indeed. Mm. What was your question? What was the best thing you learned when studying NLP? Ali Shaw would like yeah, to know. Yeah, Ali. Well, um, do you know what? That's the, this is the only question I know about in advance, because I, Ali did post that on Facebook. Mm. And I think it's a brilliant question, and it made me think. Because when we started when I started this training back in 2007 people said well what is NLP and I couldn't answer it Mm. because I didn't know um and you know the questions forced on me now and obviously over those years I've thought about it in summary NLP I think it's a great way of modeling people yeah I mean if you want to be really good at something save yourself some time and study somebody who is very successful and find out what they're doing that you're not and, and copy or model them. You know, that's what human beings do. That's how we learn stuff. There's no question in my mind that although hypnosis is not a, um, a formal or a necessary constituent of NLP, I think it goes so well together. And Richard Bandler, the co-founder of the NLP movement, is one of the best hypnotists in the world, without question. And I learnt so much about hypnosis from him and use it every day because hypnosis is not some sort of weird thing. We're all hypnotists. You look at a a mother with her child. I mean, we we could communicate with our bodies and through sound long before we developed a voice box and used words and stuff like that. So... Um, you know, there we are. That's a that's sort of a quick summary of hypnosis. And then the other thing which I learned, which came to me much later, is the precision of language that we use, the precision mm. of words, because words are very artificial. It's what people have created over the thousands of years. But far more important are the emotions that are behind the words that people use. That's, that's some of the problems that people have with NLP. Is like, oh, he's an NLP. He's into neuro-linguistic programming. Yeah. He's, he's using some kind of weird mind magic on me. That's, yeah. what people, that's the problem that people have with it. So, yes, I've heard that. Well, it, it, as you know, Tony, it, it's, it's not mind magic uh, like that at all. And we're not a, we're not a cult of people. We, well, we've just got a set of tools, uh, some of which we find useful as all of the other tools that we have and the other things that we've learned on mm. our journeys um, I would actually my answer is quite similar mm-hmm. because yeah when people say what is NLP mm-hmm. I mean NLP most people have kind of heard about NLP and they know what it's all about or they know a little bit of what it's all about but they don't really understand it and one of the first definitions I heard was NLP is like figuring out what works and yeah. doing more of it yeah and figuring that out by studying other people. But also, perhaps the thing that I picked up, Ali, more than anything else, was uh, figuring out what works for myself. Yeah. And um, as you know, I'm a bit of a, of a geek when it comes to tracking stuff. <laughs> you know, but I, I'm quite passionate about figuring out what works by actually putting stuff down on paper. So, okay, today I'm feeling good. Well, why is that? And then tracking a few things. Was it because I ate raspberries yesterday? Was it because I meditated in the morning? You get some proper data on what works. You can't argue with it. No. Um, which is why I'm developing an app, which will, which will help you do this. But, well, it's, but it turns out it's quite expensive to make an app. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Yeah, yeah but I mean, that, that's a good point, Tony. And I, actually, I don't think you're a geek because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, when I worked, used to live and work in the corporate world, people said, if you can't me- measure it, you yeah. can't manage it. So, you know, you're measuring your health and uh, it's a biofeedback and you're learning what works and what doesn't. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Mm. You know, um, just before we started this interview, I was telling you about a supplement that I've been taking. Mm. And it's, a, it's quite an obscure supplement. It's, uh, it's called Oh, hang on. I'll actually go and get it. I'll just leave that there. You probably still hear me. 
Yeah, yeah. Shall, I, oh. shall I talk to your listeners while... <laughs> It's so technical, this. I, I barely know where you can even buy it. It's called CBS slash BHMT Assist. Mm. And it's a dietary supplement for people who've taken the 23andMe genetic testing and have figured out that they are what they call, they have a, a gene mutation of either the CBS gene or the BHMT gene. Okay. Right, so pretty obscure. It's quite hard to get. And there's two ingredients, N-acetyl-L-carnitine, Mm-hmm. which is uh, an amino acid, yep. and yucca powder. Yep. And that's it. Okay, well, I've got no idea what yucca yeah. pow- powder is, but I recognise the other one as well, an yucca's, amino acid. Well, yucca's a, a plant. Is it? It's a, it's a root. Mm. And if you go to Brazil, you, you've been to Brazil, you know, they give mm. you a lot of yucca bread, and they give you, like, yucca sticks instead of bread sticks, and it's great if you're gluten-free, although it's quite high in sugar, I think. Anyway, it dampens down the CB, the uh, self, the extra sulfur in the body. All very technical and all a little bit obscure. But I was recommended to take this. Good. So I've been tracking it. Mm. And my tracking, my energy levels on a day-to-day basis without taking this are around 79% out of 100. Arbitrary figure, but that's me measuring out of 100 how I feel on a day-to-day basis. My average energy levels when taking this, 86%. Wow. That's quite, that's, yeah. And I think there's an element of NLP that I'm using in tracking that stuff because I'm trying, I'm figuring out what works. Yeah. No. And and you're not worried about the hair growing on the back of your hands and all that kind of stuff? Well, I'd be quite good if it did. (laughs) (laughs) No. No, why not, Tony? There is, there is a little bit of a problem with yucca. Mm -hmm. And it is, and in big quantities, apparently it can boost your estrogen levels. I don't want to get man boobs, Steve, but I th- I'm hoping I'm going to be all right. <laughs> I don't know where to put my eyes at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ali, thank you for your question. Nick Techen says, can you give more details on your 40 years of Zen experience? Did you take before and after brainwave tests? How did they compare? So I um, thought it'd be interesting to talk about um, 40 years of Zen, which obviously I talked about a couple of months ago. And then I wanted to ask you about what you use to meditate, because I know you meditate every day. Um, obviously, 40 Years of Zen was this program that I went on in January, and essentially, it's sitting in a dark room for a week and having electrodes attached to your head. And at times, by turn, having electrical stimulation sent into your brain, and also um, having your brain waves read and then fed back to you in something called neurofeedback. It's not the kind of thing you get in holiday brochures. No, and uh, that's a good question, Nick, because when I met Tony last week, I wanted to know all about it as well. So yeah. what else are you going to say about that, Tony? Yeah. You've come back a different man, by the way. Have I? Yeah, yeah. I, I, feel, I feel good. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, you look good. Well, I'm the same man, but maybe there's a, there's a certain increased self-awareness. That was the best thing that, mm. that came from it. So, you know, I mean, day one, they kind of sit you down and they told you not to wash your hair. <laughs> um, so I was sitting there with kind of hedgehog hair. No, sorry, you have to wash your hair, but you can't put any product in it. So it's got to be totally clean. Okay. Um, so I was sitting there with hedgehog hair. And then I'm kind of sitting prone as they smear on all this kind of conductive gel on various parts of your scalp. And then they're fixing electrodes to your brain well, to your scalp and to your skull that then feed into this laptop. I'm thinking, where are we going here, you know? <laughs> but the incredible thing about neurofeedback is that it is literally reading what's going on in your brain. Yeah. And this technology wasn't even available until a few years ago and is, like many areas of health tech, is moving on very quickly. So the first day I sat in there and they were like, well, try different types of meditation. So I tried... Um, uh, repeating a mantra, a detached awareness style of meditation, practicing gratitude, emptying my mind, all these different things. And then you come out and you look at the kind of readout on the screen and you can literally see what, what's what been going on in your brain and what the alpha brain waves, which is what we were focusing on most of the week to heighten our meditative powers, how kind of, how increased they were. Turns out when I was practicing a detached awareness form of meditation. So almost looking at what was going on in my brain with a detached awareness, saying, oh, okay, well, now I'm thinking about what's for dinner, but that will soon pass. And that detached awareness worked better for me than anything else. Mm. But they said that gratitude works better for a lot of people there. Yeah, mm. I've heard that. So yes, in answer to Nick's question, over the course of the week, every time that we did a session, we did 
get before we get we kind of got before and after and all the way through readouts. Now the problem was that they they didn't want to encourage us to kind of study the graphs too much. But obviously we all came out of the pods every day and we were like, "What are my scores?" <laughs> yeah, and they were like, "It's not scores. It's just a readout." Yeah. Well, there was one person on the course who was just fantastic at getting into a meditative state super quickly. So I was looking at her scores on the first day and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to try harder tomorrow. <laughs> um, but yeah, incredible experience. I did feel like I deepened my meditative practice. Um, over the course of the week, my alpha brainwave states, the comparison between the start of the week and the end of the week was very interesting. I was massively getting into a meditative state quicker and much deeper as well. So I was kind of better at it. Because while you're doing this stuff, you've got headphones on, which is, it's um, playing various sounds in your ear, which are apparently similar to the treats that you might give a dog if you were training it. So if you're training a puppy and the, and the puppy sits down, you'll get a little tidbit. Mm-hmm. We and call that a Pavlovian reflex. Yeah, that's a Pavlovian reflex. Yeah. That's a, basically, it's giving my brain a little tidbit every yeah. time I was doing what it wanted me to do. And so it's very clever. Um, yeah, it was a trippy week. And obviously, it's not for the faint-hearted in terms of its cost, because it costs $15,000. So you could have a new kitchen, or you could go to 40 Years of Zen. I personally would definitely recommend that. I feel like my levels of self-awareness, how I understand myself, how to build on the good bits, and how to work on my numerous bad bits, um, that's, that's been pretty magical. Yeah. Mm. It sounds fantastic, and... Uh... $15,000 is a lot of money and it would buy a kitchen. Um, the chances are you'll be changing the kitchen every 10 years. But if you can learn to meditate, that's a gift that lasts a lifetime. That's a good point. It's funny, actually, because I was like, because, you know, living in London, you always kind of want more space. And recently I was thinking it'd be nice to just move out a little bit and have a bigger, bigger place and have a bit of outdoor space and everything else. And then I just thought... Or I could just meditate more every day and that would probably make me happier and without all the stress and money involved in moving house. Well, that's a good good way to look at it. And in, back to NLP, we call that a reframe, don't we? Mm. And um, that's a powerful technique. I mean, there is always a way, almost always a way, to turn something negative into a positive. And if you make a habit of doing that, it becomes automatic and just that alone will change your brain chemistry. Mm. So... So that's my answer to Nick's question about 40 years of Zen. And I've actually just written an article uh, which is going in Balance magazine in the next couple of weeks. So, uh, Nick, I'll afford you a copy of that. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Steve, because I know, and we have spoken before about heart rate variability, but just, I always think it's, you know, it's quite ni nice knowing people about daily routines, isn't it? And you've got a pretty solid daily routine. Uh, so, so tell us about it. Well, actually, probably less solid than it used to be. I w I've stumbled across um, heart rate variability and heart math about five or six years ago. Um, there was an Olympic, an ex-Olympic medalist, actually, who was very much into this. And so I went to it because at that time I was doing a lot of sports coaching and I thought I could use the technique with my clients, which, which I have done. Mm. And uh, the routine that I, that I got into was that I had the, the, um, the heart math program on my computer and uh, um, religiously every morning I would spend about eight or ten minutes wired up doing my meditation. And it's very similar to what uh, you were describing, you know, you get the biofeedback, you get a little um, pinging noise in your ear yes. when you've, you know, you've the achieved tidbit. it. Yeah. And uh, if on the screen, it goes green. And when I was on this training course, uh, there was somebody who was actually, I have to be modest, it was me. I was getting, <laughs> I was getting a lot of green. And um, so the people came around to try and work out what I was doing. And the, um, the, the lady who was the facilitator, she said, you know, we mustn't, like your people said, don't obsess about the score. The score's mm. not important. And they call that green envy. You see, they say, right. never, 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 never look at what another person's doing. Always look at what, and what you're doing. And fortunately, the next day, just in case I was becoming not modest, um, I couldn't get off the red lights all day either. Right. So, no, yeah. yeah. Well, the moment you start thinking about your score, you're yeah. coming out of meditation. Exactly. That's exactly yeah. that's exactly the point they're trying to make. 
Um, I mean, you, you imagine um, being in, in, in your study, if you've got a keyboard or something, and playing a lovely piece of music, and you're having a great fun, and then six, six people come in with clipboards, stand behind you, and start marking you on your technical proficiency. Mm. Even if you were a concert pianist, yeah. I think you would go out of that flow state. Yeah. Mm. So the, the concept of heart rate variability, mm. just to very quickly recap it, because I think we spoke about this in our first podcast, didn't we? Episode two, I think, of Zestology. You know, you, you've got a good memory, Tony. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's maybe, all this heart rate variability yeah. training I've been doing. Yeah. It's, um, you actually want, let's say your heart beats 72 beats a minute. In between those beats, the space between the beats will not be exactly the same. Great. And it's good for your heart to have lots of different spaces, some little small spaces and some big spaces. And the more that you have heart rate variability tends to be the healthier you are, the longer you'll live and the more adaptable you are to stress. Because thinking is when you encounter the lion in the jungle, your heart rate is going to go through the roof and your heart will be better able to deal with that stress. Mm -hmm. So that's what heart rate variability sensors and monitors do to, to encourage more of that. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried the, um, there's an app, isn't there, where you put your thumb on the app and, it, and the light, so you put your thumb on the camera yeah. and the light turns on and it reads your pulse. Yeah. Have you tried that? I have actually. Yeah. I, I haven't tried it enough to know, um, you know, how good or not it, it mm. is. But um, yeah, I think it's very useful. I mean, uh, sometimes simple is better than more complicated. Yeah. I, I just preferred to use the one on my computer. Yeah. Well, either of them costs yeah. less than going to 40 years of Zen. So there's, uh, for uh, sure. So there's a good point. <laughs> for sure. Just interrupting this podcast for one second to remind you that it is brought to you by Bulletproof Coffee and Supplements, supported by the delicious stuff that I, every once in a while, Instagram a picture of me sipping a coffee on my balcony. Um, it's coffee, it's MCT oil that you put in the coffee, it's uh, diet books and supplements and brain hacking and biohacking gadgets that you can use to increase your performance levels feel more energy and, and generally kind of perform better if you are interested and you'd like to know more head to bulletproof.com or .co.uk simply use the code zestology at checkout for 10 percent off and now back to the show uh, now let's get let's move on to sarah who says what are you most excited about at the moment so I'm going to fire that at you first, what, because I know you're always trying new theories and ideas. Um, what is it that's firing you up at the moment? Well, this is a very dangerous question to ask me, Tony, because I am always fascinated by new ideas. I think some people call that ADHD, but we don't, do we? <laughs> well, also, I think, you know, it's the role of a doctor to move on, because without wanting to embarrass you, when did you do your medical training? I your medical training. I, well, I qualified for medical school in 1978. Mm. And I confounded it, all predictions and qualified. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> if you think about it, the, the textbooks or the, 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 the medical knowledge that you were learning about was probably compiled a lot earlier than that as well. Mm. So I think it's the responsibility of anyone in the health and medical com uh, community to update their ideas, be yeah. interested by new concepts and so on. Yeah. You, you, you're right. I mean, fortunately, quite a bit of the medicine that I learned is still valid. But um, when I lived in the corporate world, I was I was uh, I was sent on a very expensive management training course. And I remember one of the tutors, he said, uh, to stay current in your job, you have to reinvent at least 25 percent of what you know. Now, that's a lot, and I, but I took him at face value, and I think he's absolutely right. And I do make a point of allocating a certain amount of time and money every year towards learning new stuff. I don't necessarily decide what I want to learn, because that will usually find me. You know, I'll suddenly come across something or talk to somebody, and then I'm away, and I'm trying mm. to find out more about it. Mm. And at the moment, you're excited about? I'm very excited about bioresonance therapy which again mm. is one of these things that I've stumbled across. Yeah. Um, now, if you were to Google bioresonance, you'd find some good stuff and some bad stuff. You would, Tony, yeah. like most things in life. That's true. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, because when we last met, you were telling me about bioresonance. And then I haven't tried it. 
And then I went and Googled it. And yeah, I found some like amazing testimonials of people saying that it massively helped them. And interestingly, um, th- there seems to be a, a, a similar theory or, or a vaguely similar area to what I was doing at 40 years of Zen. Very different, but it's based around the, the body and its own electrical fields, right? Yeah, <clears throat> and as you were talking about 40 years of Zen, that was exactly what I was thinking. And I, I didn't know you were going to come onto the bioresonance, but there you are, you know, with segwayed seamlessly. Mm. Because the theory of bioresonance, it goes back to an American um, uh, inventor, uh, who lived well over a hundred years ago? Called Royal Rife. Royal's a good first name, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And he, uh, he, he, he uh, his theory was that if you put um, his theory was that ev- every cell in the body has its own um, frequency at which it will resonate. And he w- he had machines that he could put a whole range of frequencies in, and if he got a big spike coming back from the body, that meant that something was out of balance. So then he would use that frequency in you know in a much low much lower voltage as a therapeutic technique to rebalance the body that's a very quick explanation um, he upset the american medical association and the establishments hugely and they basically you know did their best to shut him down and uh, and he died uh, aged 80 something penniless and a very bitter man oh, feeling yeah um, but you know, they said he was a quack, and and if you Google this thing, you'll still find the same thing. It's it's a, it's a controversial subject. Uh, I, no getting away from that. But as you say, some people believe that they've been helped. So so it's it's it. You've got a machine at home now, haven't I have, you? Yeah. And what does it do? You, you put it on every day. I do, yeah. Yeah, and mm-hmm. what happens? Well, you can use it in many different ways, and I'm still exploring. But uh, what they recommend is that uh, the first thing you should do is you go through a particular program, which they call um, they call a detox program, and it's supposed to get all of these poisons out of our body. I mean, I think it was Linus Pauling who said, you know, disease is caused by one of two things. It's either toxins and poisons we have in from the environment or it's a deficiency of something in our diet yeah okay i'm sure that's oversimplistic but anyway that's what they say you should do first you should detox yourself Mm. and then you can run a scan you know the the the, um the frequency generator will go through this set program uh you know giving your body all of these different frequencies and here we go here's another uh, um similar experience to your 40 years of zen you have a uh, a pulse monitor on your finger or attached to your earlobe and this measures heart rate variability right and if the heart rate variability jumps up quickly that show that's a hot spot and that's something that that is out of kilter so when you run this scan and from memory one of the scans lasts 10 minutes and the other one lasts just over an hour it will give you the 20 uh, the 20 biggest hits that you had. Right. And then you can use that in your own customized program. So what I'm doing now every day, and to some extent it's replaced my heart math meditation, I just wire myself up and I go through this program that in theory is correcting the things that need to be corrected. Is it working? I don't know. But I have to say, Tony, I feel good on it. Mm. And um, I've noticed, uh, you know, a few small things have got better. You know, I don't have any joint pains uh, normally I get hay fever this time of year haven't got any hay fever but who knows could be just around the corner for me couldn't it but I I think I think that it's good and I'm going to I intend to carry on with this every day and until I change my mind yeah uh, are we allowed to say the other thing you think has got better um, I can't remember what it was. Tell me. The little small bets that you've been putting oh. in sport, which have, been, which have all been winning. <laughs> it must be the biofeedback. Is it, was it called biofeedback? Biofeedback. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, you know, we, we're laughing, but I mean, I, I do feel that I'm on a lucky yeah. streak at the moment. The universe I, is giving you gifts. Well, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. I mean, I feel that. I know that it sounds incredible. Just little small bets. We need to make that. Oh, yes. But just for fun. Yeah. yeah, so we need to give a health warning. Never, ever bet on anything if you can't afford to lose it. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, just remember, I do work with professional gamblers. Yeah. And talking about that, and this is um, in the public domain, I, I work with a guy called Chris Mormon, who is the number one in the world for online poker. One more money than anybody else. 
When I first met him, he was very sceptical about some of my techniques. And I wired him up to my computer and did heart math. And we worked together for three days. His final heart math session, he got 99% green. Mm. And, and, and I told him this. And he said, what did I do wrong? What do I have to do to get 100%? I said, Chris, don't worry. You've gone from this to this. And I said, I don't know what this means for you. All I know is that your head is in a good place and because you've worked hard at this stuff. Little did he know, little did I know, two weeks later, he went on to win his first live major tournament in poker and over a million dollars. And I still have that graph. And he's given me permission to share it with people. You know, there's one case. We used to say in medicine, one case is anecdotal. Get two cases and it's a series and you can publish it. <laughs> yeah. But you asked me, do I believe in this stuff? Well, I, you've I had do. other poker winners as well. Oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. But he was the he was the, he was the, he big was the biggest. Yeah, because yeah, he's the best known. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, although I've had some pretty other famous ones. They've all done well. There's actually only one who was an amateur player. And, you know, I'm like Chris. I didn't get, you know, my one... I, I only got 99 out of 100. I wish yeah. I could have improved his luck, but I didn't. I don't know what I did wrong. I don't know what he did wrong. Mm. But, uh, well, your enthusiasm is shining through. <laughs> there you go, Sarah. I think what I'm most excited about at the moment is in terms of looking at kind of hacking performance. That's, you know, when you and I do podcasts, we tend to talk about techniques like havening or some of the stuff that we might have learned in nlp or meditation or hypnosis or the stuff that we've talked about today with biofeedback and neurofeedback in terms of nutrition i think that's another interesting thing to look at my mate john who i think you've met was over here last week and he was like all this nutrition stuff you just, i just kind of thinking eat right and you'll be fine and he was basically looking at my pile of supplements and i said to be fair mate you are 20 stone <laughs> <laughs> well I, you, I, I was looking through your shirt well not looking i could see your all your doors were open yeah. and i was having a look at all the stuff you've got i know john he wouldn't have found a single thing in there that he could have eaten no i haven't looked in your fridge did you have a cold beer because you'd have definitely had a beer uh yeah, do you want a beer? <laughs> no, I've got one in there. I don't at the moment. I don't even drink beer, but someone brought it around. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to go and get you a beer and me a glass of wine afterwards. Good. So, so the, the two things that I'm excited about at the moment are both nutrition-based. Yeah. The first is, I was quite surprised. I bought this new water filter that I've just been showing you. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Yeah, and I put something on Instagram and it had a huge response. So many people were interested because I think people notice that tap water tastes a bit rank. And, the more, and, you know, we're brought up, especially in this country, to think, oh, you know, good old tap water, that's great. But actually, when you look into it, it's not that good for you. It's not. And I don't want to scare people off, but, you know, there's a lot of chlorine in tap water because that, well, that's what makes it safe to drink. It's definitely safe. But what's the chlorine doing to your body? So I've been using water bottles for a long mm. time. But then, not only the environmental impact of using water bottles, the plastic... The BPA supposedly leaches into the water, which is not good for the body at all. Yeah, I heard that. So I did a whole lot of due diligence on various different filters. Turns out reverse osmosis filters take out, strip the water of almost everything. So that's mm -hmm. not great if you put it into your body because then it's washing your body out of all the essential minerals and nutrients that you need. And then I texted Luke Story, who's been on the podcast a couple of times. I was like, man, I'm really trying to find a water filter and don't know what to get. He recommended that little beauty over there, which I'm more proud of than virtually anything in my life. Yeah, it's bigger than some people's baths, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the Berkey water filter. I've got the travel one. If you're interested, it's, um, it's not bigger than a bath. It's <laughs> almost as big. But yeah, it's a very clever bit of kit. And it's so good that you can put a bit of food dye in it and it will take... In fact, you can put a whole bottle of food dye in it and it will take it out as it filters through the water. And if it doesn't, you know it's not working properly, which is a brilliant way to test it. Um, they're also very public about their testing and they pu they publish everything that they test. And it tastes nice. Yeah, I'm having some right now. It's, mm. it's good, yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited about that because I feel like I'm finally drinking good water that doesn't have either chlorine in it uh, plastic in it or any other kind of pathogens or viruses or any nasties that you might find in tap water or anything else. Apparently you can take that camping, put pond water in it and drink drink what comes out. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but for what I read in the newspapers, there's even hormones in water, especially in London. Yeah, because it's there's so much recycling, and uh, some people say that you know it's having bad effects on. I've us heard, I've heard about that. Yeah, mm. is estrogen, it because lots of lots water. of women in London take the pill, and that comes out in their wee, and then it gets recycled through our taps. Mm. Oh, if that's not going to sell a couple of Berkey water filters, then nothing will. Well, I hope nobody's listening to this while they're having their breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing I'm quite excited about is um, you were talking about hay fever and how you're not getting it this year. Yeah. Do you remember I was telling you last year about how I felt like I'd hacked hay fever? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I felt had made a difference, because I get hay fever like nine out of 10 most years. Last year I had it one out of 10. And I was thinking, was thinking what's this all about? Um, and I think more than anything, it was taking colostrum supplements. And I'm not going to go into this too, not, too much now, but Google it. It's basically... Uh, Milk from a cow that has just given birth turned into a pill. And they do it very ethically. They make sure it's a grass-fed cow. They make sure the cow feeds the calf first. Then they turn it into these tablets. Mm. Well, I don't think I've told you this, but when I was over in Bali, um, yeah, there's a few mozzies about, and I would get bitten every once in a while. And my allergic response to those mozzies was completely different from anything I've ever had before. Because in the past, I'd get bitten, it would swell up really big, and then it would itch for a week. In Bali, I would get bitten, it would swell up to about half the size, and then it would, and then I could barely see where it I couldn't even see it sometimes. Two hours later, it would have gone. Hmm. So two things. Either the mozzies are just different in Bali, yeah. which I actually think is quite unlikely, mm-hmm. because, so I. because I've never had such a different response before. Or secondly... My body's IG kind of allergic load has just massively gone down. I wish I could say for certain it was the colostrum. But... Well, I don't think you ever will. And uh, this little slap on your wrist here, Tony. Oh, we've, we've, said, we've said we shouldn't look at scores and results yeah. and stuff like that. The important thing is, is that you're trying all of these things and you'll never know what it might be. But things are working for you. Mm. And you, you know, you're the first to say how your health has dramatically improved over the last two or three years because of some of this stuff. Mm. Colostrum is certainly really good. I mean, I don't know about animals, but I know in humans, unless things have changed since I was at medical school, as you reminded me. (laughs) But I mean, um, breast milk from a mother is just the same. It has colostrum. And apparently that is there for a reason. It's full of all the good things that the baby needs because the baby is now flying on its own. The umbilicus cord is being cut and it's depending on its own immune system and all the rest of it. So um, So it's very good for people with bad stomachs as well, isn't it, it? colostrum? Yeah. 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 It just seems to, um, yeah, have so much good stuff in it mm. um, that it kind of fires up your immune system and for some reason your stomach as well. I can't actually remember why, but um, definitely worth Googling if you're someone who's suffering with a bit of a bad belly at the moment. Yeah. Okay, time for one more. And this is from our mutual friend, Carl Morris. Oh, Who great. we both know, who's also been a, a, a guest on Zestology before. And we're cooking up a plan in the summer, aren't we, to uh, record one with Carl and potentially with the three of us. Yeah, Carl's a great guy. Uh, you and I both know him well, and um, he's a very well-respected sports mm. psych- psychologist, isn't he? Especially in the field of golf. Yeah, mm. he's brilliant. Brilliant, yeah. Um, and he says, here's my question. What did you both learn from your most difficult client or your most difficult interview? So I'm going to take this first. And um, I... I can't, do you know what? I actually can't reveal who this was because I did one interview for Zestology and it was one of the best known guests that I've had. That's the clue that I will give people. And it was pub- it's been published, it's on the Zestology feed. And the interview started off great. I mean, this person <laughs> is well respected and, as I say, has a high profile. And then I might as well say it's a he. And then after about 15, 20 minutes, he went off one so badly, I thought, I can't use this. I could barely get a word in edgeways. It was like he was on some, it was like he was on some very strong drugs. He might have been. I think he probably was. Mm. I'm not against legal, you know, legal assistance in the form of supplements. It was like he'd done like a, a fat line of coke, basically. I mean, it was just nonsense what he was talking about. He was telling these stories. I was thinking, why are you telling me these? So we eventually managed to kind of, well, we eventually finished the interview. 
and I managed to cobble together a short podcast because you know I, I wanted to use him because I knew how many followers this guy has. Um, but that was my most difficult interview because I was just thinking all this time wasted and having managed to set up this interview in the first place, I'm not going to be able to use it. I think you can still tell that there's something very weird going on in the interview. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going to say who it was. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it, it'll come across to a listener. They'll yeah. know that something's not right, but this this is life, isn't it? Yeah, so that was my most difficult interview. And what have I learned from that? Actually, what I've learned is since then, I have done a few other interviews. And I just thought, ah, not good enough, not going to use it. And now I just if I did that interview again, I wouldn't use it. Yeah. Because if I don't like it, I just, you know, say... Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that sounds reasonable. I mean, yeah, why, I, don't want, why... I don't want to waste people's time, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's nice for people to give up an hour of your time and listen to this. Yeah. So. What about you? What was your most difficult client or difficult interview and what did you learn from it? Well, I've, I've, <clears throat> I've obviously had a few, you know, especially being a doctor and I meet a lot of people who are in distress and um, perhaps less careful with their words than they normally would be. But what I've learned, I, I can be more clear about what I've learned, and it's a, it's a great reassurance to me and hopefully to others, is I just say to myself in my head, this isn't about me. And I say that about anything that I do, this isn't about me. I, I mentioned earlier on in, in this chat um, that when I say to my, one of the first things I say to my clients is, you already have what you need. When you go to work at Sky, you don't need to worry about that because you already have what you need. Even if you get a difficult customer to interview on telly or whatever, which I'm sure you do from time to time, it's not about you. You just use your experience and, you, and your, the techniques that you've learned the hard way, the long way. And then what happens is up to what happens. And it doesn't matter what you do or don't do. So letting go. It's letting go. It's letting go. Try not to control things too much. Yeah, try not to control stuff. And and you'll actually find then, or I find then, that most things do usually go pretty well. Mm. Because... And even if it doesn't go that well, you're not going to worry yourself. You're not going to worry about yourself (laughs) and you're not going to beat yourself up. But the other thing, which is quite magical really, is that we we have to look at it from a, a third person perspective because if we've got an interview that we're not feeling good about, then the other person isn't either, and the person watching it is going to see that this just isn't working. Yeah. So, but if you're if you're in a good state, like this isn't about me, then that will communicate itself and ha- it has to relax the other person too. Mm. So, Carl. Um, thank you for that question, bro. I'll get my own back in the future. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was a good question. Yeah. And it made us think, didn't it? Definitely. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> and if you've been listening to this and thinking, oh, there's a question that I might like to ask these guys. Can't promise we'll give you a sane answer, but we'd love to hear from you and, and the usual channels. Should we do a quick book recommendation and a tip before we go? Um, you don't have to, but I, I, I'll recommend one, actually, because... I did a lot of reading while I was away Mm. and I read more fiction than non-fiction. I do read a lot of non-fiction, but I find fiction such a solid way to relax. You know, when you've got a good book, you can just completely switch off and it is wonderful. Um, And I was given a book called The Arenda, Mm -hmm. The Arenda, and it's set in Canada in the 18th and 18th century, I think. And it's such a compelling story. It's so interesting to see how people lived in Canada, especially especially the native people in Canada before the French and the English arrived there, to see how they lived, to see how in harmony they were in the earth, to, with the earth, and then what happened when the French and the English arrived and wrecked it all. Mm. Um, fascinating book, compelling, and I think you'll find it a good way to relax if you're anything like me. So that's my recommendation. Okay, I'm sure that's yeah. a good one, Tony. Do you know what I, I have? I don't read as many books as you, and I have read a good one recently, but I can't remember what it's called. So we'll skip over that. But well, I'll def- tell, me, tell us what it's about, and we'll, we'll use the power of Google to find it. Okay, well, it's a story about a, a blind girl um, whose father worked in a museum, um, I think it was in Paris, 
And it was it. The story starts. Um, it's the Second World War. You know when the Germans. Oh, that's, that's enough to go on. <laughs> yeah, and they end. They end up in. Le Havre. No, don't, don't spoil yeah. it for us. Okay, but it's it's a wonderful story because, you know, you don't unless you're blind yourself, you don't often put yourself in the position of thinking like a blind person would, and how difficult life can be. And the, there's also quite a lot about, it's, it's a very sensitive book regarding the psychology of people. And that's probably one of the reasons why I liked it. So definitely worth a read if you can find out what it's called. Yeah. Have you joined the uh, Zestology Book Club on Facebook? I haven't. Is it free? It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I We've don't got know a book I... club on uh, Facebook now, which I, saw that. Just, it, I just wanted to do it to, um, to bring all the book recommendations from Zestology into one place. Mm. Because I know people, you know, mostly nonfiction, but most people, you know, when people are looking for a book, sometimes they don't know what to go for next. Yeah. So it's there. So yeah, if anyone wants to join the Zestology book club, if you search for that on Facebook, then you can be a part of it. Well, that, that's a great idea because, uh, I mean, we, by definition, those who are members of Zestology and all the rest of it, we all share very similar things. Mm. So a, recommend, a book recommendation from one person is probably going to be a very good one to follow. Because yeah. I, I, I don't read the newspapers about books. I buy all my books on recommendation. And yeah. I've made some dreadful mistakes. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, I spend too much money on books. Steve, I think we've, we've covered the tips in the uh, previous section of can this. Can I give uh, one more? Oh, yeah, go on then. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've, I've, I think it's important. I've mentioned it before. It's a simple one. Don't look at the scoreboard. Don't look at the scoreboard. Yeah, you know I need I mean? to be told that when I was at forty years of Zen. Yeah, yeah. I just, sometimes though, I don't mind looking at the scoreboard. No, it's going to change your mental state. Whatever it is in life, the scoreboard is a metaphor. Don't constantly be looking to see how well you're doing or not doing, because um, it's important to have some kind of biofeedback, but not in terms of a score. Because generally speaking, just like Chris Mormon, he was annoyed he only got 99 out of 100. We've all got that sort of competitive streak in us. It's better to just to, like I say, it's not up to me. It's not up to you. We just do the best we can, get into the right mental state. We show up, see what happens. Good stuff. What's your website again? www.drstephensimpson.com www.drstephensimpson.com Yeah, and in my next career I'm going to get a, a, an easier website to remember. Well, it doesn't sound too hard to remember. It's okay. your name.com name, yeah. <laughs> There's just a little bit of kind of spelling admin involved in yeah. the middle of that. Yeah, mouthful. Steve, thank you very much. We're going to do this again, aren't we, at some point? So, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's go and have a drink. Definitely. Thanks a lot for having me on the show, Tony, and thank you for your listeners for some fantastic questions. And uh, yeah, I hope we do, will do it again. Just before we finish this podcast, I wanted to remind you I've got a competition on at the moment, details at the start of the podcast, but essentially leave a review, let me know that you've left a review and you could win an hour's consultation with Dr. Stephen Simpson. You can talk about absolutely anything. Perhaps you'd like to increase your performance or productivity levels. Perhaps you'd like to talk about a health matter that's bothering you. Perhaps you'd like to talk about poker. He works with a lot of the world's top poker players. You can uh, just leave an iTunes review and, you, uh, and then let me know and you're in and we'll pick a winner at the end of the month. And the reason that I'm banging on about iTunes reviews, and you probably hear other podcasters banging on about it as well, is that when you leave iTunes reviews, it massively helps our podcast climb the chart. So appreciate any review that you'd leave, and do let me know as well. Uh, use your channels, and then we can enter you in the draw. This podcast is proudly supported by Bulletproof Coffee and Supplement. They've got a lot of new supplements at the moment, including one on sleep. So if you're someone who doesn't sleep great, there is a new Bulletproof Sleep Supplement. I've not tried it yet, actually. It's so new that I've not tried it, but I know they're selling it now. So um, if you've tried it, do let me know how you go. And remember to use the code ZESTOLOGY at checkout for 10% off. That's it. See you next time.